Hi, thank you for joining me. It's Ken Maynard at Divorce the Smart Way. We're going to talk about separation agreements. First, let's talk about the no separation agreement. And I do see this in my practice where couples don't do separation agreements initially and they come to me many years later and it's a tangled mess that I got to clean up with them. And that's good. It's good for business. It's not good for them. But when I ask them why didn't they do a separation agreement, this is the answers I typically get is at the time it was they wanted to avoid conflict. You know, it was a difficult time for them and they didn't want any more conflict in their lives and they couldn't imagine working that out. Uh, they had fears of dealing with lawyers. What will it cost? You know, will they escalate the animosity? Uh, and those are legitimate fears. They're emotion they were emotionally exhausted and that's fair too. Financial constraints, meaning they just couldn't afford to do a separation agreement. And that's where you've got to talk about what is the priority of your funds and how to protect your financial future. Because that's what really a separation agreement does, is it protects each of, each of yours financial futures. Or they're hoping for a reconciliation. One of them or both of them are, are kind of secretly hiding out saying, uh, I think that they'll come back. or just give it some time. Well, that's what a separation agreement was for, is to give each of you time before you do a divorce application. Or you have a spouse that's trying to maintain control or connect connection to the other one. By being obstructive, they just frustrate the other spouse and hoping that the other spouse doesn't pursue a separation agreement. Very dangerous situation. Or they're naive. They just don't see the need. Right? Why would I go and spend all this money? I, I go my way. She goes her way. We split the house. Uh, she takes her car. I take my car. Life is good. That's kind of a naive way of looking at it. You know, I had a couple a few years back that came to me. They separated 15 years ago. He was an investment dealer. She was a school teacher. Fast forward 15 years with no separation agreement. Uh, things didn't play out so well for him. He came back and said, you know what, I need spousal support. And it was devastating for her because she was just at the time of retirement. She had set up her retirement. She had rented a, a nice condo, set up her life, and now uh, there's enough, a financial interruption going to happen here where she is legally obligated to pay him spousal support. And I helped them work that through, but uh, you know, certainly pulled on my heartstrings. I could see, or, you know, her points in all of this, and I could see his. But if they had cleaned it up earlier by having a separation agreement, then she would know for sure what her financial future looked like, with some degree of certainty, and he would know with some degree of certainty that. It, Pursuing spousal support is not an option, and he would have to pursue other ways of supporting himself. So the potential problems in the future for those people who don't have separation agreements in place is your spouse gets frustrated. Remember, there's two parties to this. There's you and your spouse, and if you are the party that's saying, I don't think we need one, the other one may say, yeah, I think we do need one. And they may get to a place in time where they say, that's it, I'm going to see a lawyer. And next thing you know, you're in court, you're in a adversarial entangled process that's going to tie you up for a while and cost both of you a lot of money. Doing a separation agreement with Divorce the Smart Way, we look at how to create a soft landing for each of you future spousal support claims. So this is where, you know, you both may be gainfully employed right now and have good health, but life has a way of throwing curveballs at us. And next thing you know, one of you becomes laid off or ill and cannot support yourself. Without a separation agreement, you're quite okay to go after the other party, your former partner, and ask for spousal support. And that can be very disruptive to that person. Uh, if you're getting a spousal support claim on you after you've went out and reestablished your life, you may have bought a house, you may be carrying a mortgage, you may have uh, uh, 
a new partner. You may even have children in the second marriage, and this comes along. It can really, really rock the boat. Uh, entangled finances. This is uh, an example of this. I had a, a lady that separated from her spouse a number of years, and she came to me and, and very upset. She says, you know, I've, I've saved my money. I've earned some more money. I've got additional money, and now I'm ready to go buy a house, and I can't because on my credit bureau, I'm still connected to my spouse who's had a line of credit, and some credit cards and a motorcycle loan that is holding me back from getting approval for a mortgage. So you end up getting stuck in your life. This is the, many lenders now are, are, are asking, okay, so if you're separated, where is your separation agreement? Or if you're a 50 something male or female, have you been married before? And if you have, where's your separation agreement? They want to know. And the reason why they want to know, because in there would delineate what your financial obligations are. It could be you paying child support, spousal support, or receiving or paying uh, equalization payments. They need to know. And without the separation agreement, they don't know, they can't give approvals. This is also spouse's debt impacting your credit score, and I just talked about that, but that, uh, that's a very serious thing that you need to get cleared up. Exposures to spouse's current or future debts, and again, I just talked about that, but this is where you may be all debt-free, each of you now, and you've, it's not apparent that you're connected credit-wise because our banks are very, very crafty at getting plural signatures on documents that you may not ever remember signing or you actually maybe never did sign but in the fine print it was plural and several liability your estate is at risk because you're still married if without a separation agreement and people don't know if you don't have a separation agreement and along comes uh, on your death along comes your former spouse and says you know what I, I, want a, I want a piece of that. I'm, I'm the wife. I'm the husband. Very real possibility. And changing the, your RSP, pension, and life insurance beneficiary is not enough. Uh, it, it just, it's just not going to protect those assets from claims from a former spouse. So these verbal agreements that you have when you separate without a written agreement, well, we all know that verbal agreements are hard to prove. So it's always open to a court action because you've got nothing to stand on. You've got nothing to point to that said, hey, we had an agreement on this. There's no peace of mind. I, people separate without these agreements, and I'm thinking, how do you go out and buy a car or uh, buy a new house or start a new life with a new partner without cleaning up the old one. It's high risk. You end up with little or no clarity or certainty around money, property, children, debts. You stay financially entangled. You can't move on. You get stuck. It may not be apparent to you now, but as this unfolds over time, you will see that you will get stuck on something. Then there's the separation agreement only, and this is where the people you know, we live in a day and age where if we can read about it on the internet, we think we can do it. And we go off to, let's say, Staples, or we go download a, uh, an agreement uh, that's on the internet, and we start filling it out. Generally, these agreements are not current to the latest court ruling, so the languaging is maybe a little bit outdated. They're missing sections on important things like pensions. But, you know, of course, it's better than no agreement. But there's a gotcha. This often lacks the financial disclosure. This is basically each of you exchanging your financial picture, putting it into a financial statement, and calculating an equalization. It generally lacks a thing called a certificate of independent legal advice. This is where you go and sit with a lawyer 
The lawyer reviews the agreement and its impacts with you to be sure you're under, he or she understands what they're signing and they're not signing under duress or threat. That's what the Certificate of Independent Legal Advice assures. And without that, these agreements can easily be attacked, open for review, and overturned by courts. Happens regularly. The trap. Here's the trap. So you each uh, fill out these forms. You do your own separation agreement. And dollars to donuts. One of you is going to say, hey, honey, let's take this to a lawyer and have a lawyer look at it, just so we're sure. And now you're pulled into a process. The lawyer looks at it and they're going to shove it off to the side of the desk and says, yeah, the agreement's okay. I look at it as more of your wish list. Uh, we've got some work to do on the agreement. It's not quite up to scratch. And then the process starts and the letter's going back and forth between your lawyer and his lawyer because you can't have the same lawyer. And next thing you know, your costs are ballooning like very quickly. Because lawyers negotiate by correspondence, they like write letters, and when they write letters, it costs you money. This is where any responsible practitioner needs to get you to. You need to have a separation agreement. For those that have children, there will be a parenting agreement on the side, a sworn financial statement, this is the financial disclosure, and a certificate of independent legal advice. If you get these components, these three components in place, what you have is a durable and binding agreement. Durability means that it's long lasting. Binding means that it's legally binding. It's, it's a true contract. For it to be a true contact, and of course, it's got financial disclosure. It shows an informed consent, meaning, yeah, I knew what I was signing. And you've got that independent legal advice. Much better. Written agreements are durable, legally binding. There are low risk to future court actions. You've got clarity and certainty around your money, around your children and co-parenting arrangements and your debts. You are no longer financially entangled. You can move on in life, you have peace of mind, and your divorce is likely to be granted. If you're pursuing a divorce at the end of all of this process, then you got to demonstrate on the divorce application that you have settled your financial affairs. And to do that is a separation agreement. Thank you for joining me. I hope this has shed some light on what a separation agreement will do for you and hope to hear from you soon. Take care. Ken Maynard at Divorce the Smart Way. Thank you.